you've been in Berlin all this time, and during this time, Berlin is transforming. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> when do you think that sort of renaissance started, that, that this kind of period of insane, rein well, not even reinvention, but just mm. growth as this night club techno mecca that it, people <laughs> that it yeah. kind of is now? It's, it's really hard to put your finger on like any particular date, but probably um, the development behind this was that Berlin um, opened to all sorts of people from all over the world coming in and discovering the city for themselves as a place where you can be creative in ways that other cities don't allow you. Because um, living is cheap in Berlin, you have loads of opportunities. If you want to do a gallery, if you want to do a club, it's very easy to rent something. Um, you don't have the police in every night uh, or whatever, you know, just bothering you. So it's very easy to um, take an idea and to realize it within a very short time span. And you can't do this in many like big European or cities in the Western world in general. So when people internationally grew away of this and came into Berlin, I think that's where the change really happened. And then Berliners started to, well, um, get more for self-esteem and uh, start to do things. And probably when the Osgood club opened, that was maybe the starting signal to say, well, here's something new going on. And that's the Berghain and That's Karamba. now Berghain. It used to be Ostgut at another place, but the new building now is called Berghain. So what, you know, if you, if you were to try and put this in context, I mean, what are the um, cultural and historical circumstances of Berlin being able to be this kind of place with very little red tape, with, you know, mm. where people can come and realize their dreams in a sort of realistic time period? It always happens, you know, when, when you um, enter a time of chaos where everything restructures. I mean, like the 1920s in Berlin, it's like the obvious parallel where this whole state was in uh, transformation and collapse and everything. Right. For many reasons, um, in the 50s, it didn't really happen because of occupation forces being uh, quite rigid in establishing uh, a new order. But, but then after 1990, you had a whole administration that didn't have a clue what to do with all of East Berlin, basically. And it took them years to figure out, you know, how this city would develop. And that's, you know, where creative people can actually jump in and do something. Um, you, you can see this in many cities when change happens on a, on a big urban scale, like New York in, in the late, late 70s, early 80s, mm -hmm. London in the late 70s, probably, Moscow in the 90s as well, St. Petersburg always when you have a big, big political change that affects urban living on, on a very broad scale, that's when amazing things can happen creatively. Must be an amazing thing to be, to feel that you're in the middle of. I mean, you, because you, you <laughs> genuinely are. You've been, yeah. you know, right, right there. And also, not only have you been right there in terms of a, um, a city that has been changing and growing, you know, before the world's eyes, but also you've been producing and DJing in an industry that has been changing and shifting in front of the world's eyes as well. Now, um, this is something <laughs> this is something you've written about at, right, right. at length and, and quite brilliantly, I think, Thanks. actually. Um, Hope so. And, you know, we will definitely put a link to this, actually, uh, <laughs> on, this, on this page when we release this film because it's something any of you who have an interest in... Uh, existing in the recording industry, especially in electronic music, should definitely be aware of. Now, you know, when you first started, um, things were, I guess things were, were starting to change, weren't they? What was it like? I think in the very first two or three years, um, you still didn't, didn't really sense the change because you had these very strong indie labels in electronic music and you had all these artists having amazing careers and it was possible to actually consider I could be just a producer, I don't have to DJ. I'm, I'm lucky I didn't decide that then because now it would be maybe harder for me to, to exist on the music I do but um, back then it was still possible to just make a living on selling records so you could just sit in the studio and create what, what you love to do and share it with people. People would be happy to go and buy out your record and everyone is basically fine. That change became obvious around, I guess, 2002, 2003, uh, when 
sales fell like for all labels very very instantly and um, many distributing companies folded leaving those indie labels that were doing well before um, not seeing their money so many labels including classic including later Perlon and you know like many labels we know hopefully some of them or most of them at least classic and Perlon are still around mm. but they have seen times where a distributor falls and says, well, we owe you like 30,000 euros and well, they're gone. <laughs> that's, that's very harsh because instantly you, you have people who depend o on that income and they just, they just put off and said like, well, you, all your effort was for nothing. Yeah. And it took everyone years to recognize how permanent this change would be. So, Years later, sales fell even more. You know, before you could you could sell like five thousand units from a single that even wasn't close to being a club hit. Now the same thing sells for some labels three hundred, for others one hundred and twenty, for others five hundred, which is almost like a hit now in vinyl. Plus digital sales now, which is new. But yeah. that all is a transformation that took some time. It wasn't quite obvious from the start. Because you know, labels like um, I guess Classic and its heyday were. I mean, how many records would they be pressing? For a lot. <laughs> I, I can't even pin down the numbers, but um, I think when I started there, like the regular single, which was not a hit, sold easily four to five thousand records. The hit sold tens of thousands of records still. Right, and now the average pressing, first pressing for record is. Well, the official number three hundred, but the reason it is three hundred is because you basically can't press less. Yeah. That doesn't mean people sell yeah. 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know this from experience, <laughs> right. having a vinyl label. Um, but uh, for you, what was the moment where you thought, okay, you know, it's changing, the industry is changing, I've got to change the way I think about it. Was there a kind of a particular release or a particular moment? Well, I think um, basically when, when I found it, the label Macro together with my partner Finn Johansen and we still started out in 2007 where you could sell like 2,000 records on vinyl plus some digital plus you had people licensing the tracks for DJ mix CDs and compilations and you could basically get paid for your work you wouldn't get wealthy on it but uh, you could create an outlet where you can get your music out where you can advertise what you do so people know this is Stefan and he does this kind of music and you can book him and he'll come and play maybe so um, that is still feeling okay for us but then sales kept going down and we were hearing this from everyone and we're like okay something has been changing and then I started to become uh, to, to get more and more promos every week from other labels and like in the, in the beginning I was like okay you know people get to know me and they start sending me more but the scale was getting outrageous at some point that if I would allow people to send me digital promos I'd probably get like 500 a week or something yeah. so there is a very clear signal okay like now everyone and their grandmothers are competing like for the same tiny slot and that is really new quality it's like the so-called democratization mm. happened where everyone instantly could basically produce some music that would sound like house or techno and they could send it to you because they wouldn't have to send a vinyl but they yeah. could just send you a link because that i think that's maybe the fallacy isn't it people people when when this kind of production equipment became available to people crack right. and cracks of it mm -hmm. you know you could get sort of free copies right. off the internet and um you know everyone was like it's amazing all these things that you know weren't all these um options and tools that weren't available to people for so long now everyone can make music right. but it's not really like that is it well um i think you have to or we have to differentiate between um, if you just want to have some fun and produce music and maybe play it to your friends or share it over the internet and uh, win your friends with your music and have an exchange. You can totally do this now. So that's the real democratization in it. But if you want to have any perspective of reaching more people or um, spending your life in music actually, seriously and developing interesting stuff and make a living on it at some point and just really to devote yourself to it it's been never that hard like it is now so you have these two things happening at the same time yeah yeah absolutely you know that that's the thing i think people um you know young djs would think that being sent loads of free music perhaps uh is an amazing um 
wonderful thing to happen to them but the uh, reality of it is, 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 is quite different it's just a constant deluge isn't it oh, of yeah. music it's, it's a flood uh, actually I mean I'm now at a point where um, I can I can tolerate it more because it gives you new opportunities because actually most of this new music is very similar like one with each other and um, when when you deviate from that you really have a chance to stand out against it. Um, the advantage of it is, back in the old days of um, physical distribution, you would have many, many people telling you what you can distribute and what not. To start with a label saying like, well, we want to sell 5,000 units or whatever, and we can't do it with this. Um, and the distributor would say, well, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to ship this to the stores because they, won't put it up on the shelves or something. So you yeah. had limited shelf space, and many people standing between you and the people that might eventually grab your music off that store shelf. So now that's removed, and you can really reach the audience directly. But um, if you try to reach it with mainstream kind of stuff, like even within electronic music, like narrow genres like Deep House or something, you still have a Deep House mainstream. In, in the old distribution economy, you would basically have to do this in order to um, have no trouble with your distribution people. They would um, totally push you to do this and not something that's like yeah. unrelated to, to what they right. used to sell. And, and now it's the opposite. If, if you do what no one does, you have more chances to, to reach an audience and leave like all these other people to the side to do all the same. That's the real new thing. And this is the key. It's a chance. This is the, the possibility. Mm. Right. You know, to, um, so if you, what you're saying is, is that it's not about genrefication, it's not about following those same old channels no. as everyone that's, else. That's that, really. It's, the, it's my private theory, but um, I think you can totally prove this in the marketplace that um, you have one thing that opens a new category, like any artist ever since Johann Sebastian Bach who's been successful for a long time right. was an innovator in his category and then you have like all these followers and you never remember the followers I mean you can go through any century and you name the five key artists yeah. and then you'll know these five names and you'll maybe know ten names but you won't know like the other followers so who anyone who could establish a new category and associate his name with that music would stand out, would have a chance, but all the followers now have no chance at all. So what you have is people who open new categories, get their audience, and then you have followers who are like totally forgotten after two or three years, at yeah. the latest, sometimes even like within six months.